The following message is from Lifeline Heart of Worship. We hope this is a blessing to your life. Welcome to Lifeline Heart of Worship. Healing for the body, mind, and soul is our vision. It's simple. We want the the Lord to make you whole. We want the Lord to make you complete. When you do your part, He does His part. When you do the possible, He does the impossible. Amen? That's what we believe here at Lifeline. And we're grateful that you you took the time to be with us this morning. Um, The Lord has been moving throughout this whole year, and we're excited for what He's done. And before we continue, we just want to give a shout out to Nate. Nate's the latest addition to the heart of worship. Amen. We welcome him aboard. If you're ready, I'm ready. Are you ready? The Bible app and the Lifeline app are, are on. You'll have your verses on the Bible app and on the Lifeline app. They'll also be on your screen. We're going to hit part two today. How many of you were blessed with part one last week? Bitterness. Yeah. If I could subtitle today, it would be unforgiveness. Uh, we talk about it every Sunday, some form or fashion, but I'm really going to focus on it today with a story that the Lord showed me that is almost uh, 2,000 years and older. I mean, it's just an old story. Of course, it's in history. It's in the Bible. But it's funny how today we're still suffering from that. So having said that, if you're ready, I'm ready. Would you help me preach Proverbs 2:11? Watch what it says. Just read along with me. Discretion will what? And understanding will? Discretion will? And understanding will? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing in this place, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the heart of worship. We thank you, Lord, for all our volunteers and leaders, Lord, that make this place a house of worship, Lord. We know that the building is not the church. We know that we are the church. So we thank every church member here, every part, Father God, that comes in, Father God, early and sacrifices their time to make this a place of worship. Father, now I ask you, Lord, to just stay with our children next door and stay with us here, Father God. Holy Spirit, just speak through me so that I may share the way, the word you gave to me, Father God, that I may share it to your people clear, Father God. No confusion, Father, but let them have conviction but yet clarity father let us let this word break us and mold us father god let it break the hardest heart and mend the broken heart and holy spirit we just lift up all our covenant partners we lift up all those that give online and those that give here in the lobby lord we don't pass the bucket father god we are faithful to you and we believe father god that you will move your people to give we don't have to manipulate people to give and so we thank you for them you bless them father god financially for their faithfulness so i thank you in advance lord now holy spirit do your thing Speak through me so that I can speak through your people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Would somebody say? Amen. Amen. Would you touch three people and say, you better learn to forgive. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. As people are getting situated and getting seated, you're going to see on your screen... uh, for, you probably didn't know because we only mentioned it to our leaders, but we did something called Operation Police Navidad. And we went to Harlingen PD and we blessed them with goodies. You're going to see some pictures behind me. Uh, it was awesome. We went to Harlingen PD. We're grateful for what they do. We believe that all lives matter and we back the blue here at Lifeline. Amen. So we're grateful for that. And like I said, don't feel like you were left out. You say, well, nobody mentioned it or anything. No, this was, this was done within just the leadership of the church. And we want to thank all of you leaders that, that donated items and baked goods and so on and so forth and showed up uh, that morning to give it to the police. I mean, they, they were so grateful. The police chief says, thank you. Uh, he's grateful to, to, to us. I say, look, I'll give you 12, 12 cupcakes for a speeding ticket. I mean, let's just make this work. <laughs> he's like, Pastor, you're under arrest for bribing a cop. <laughs> like, darn <laughs> no, but they were very, very grateful. So we thank you for those that are taking part. And also, just, just so you can have a quick update, uh, last week we said we were at 598 commitments. And, and I said, you know, our goal was 600, and I guess someone took it to heart. And they went right there and signed up for the last four weeks and did what they had to do. So we're actually at 602 commitments, and we're up to 84,757. Yeah. <clears throat> So BTV just wants me to let you know that, that you can stop at the table if you have a balance. You don't know where your balance is, where you left off. Maybe you, got, you missed some Sundays. 
You can stay with them. They're not going to, you know, take your credit card or your fingerprints or anything like that. You're going to be all right. But, but we do want you to stop by so you can know what your balance is. And we thank you for your generosity. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, Proverbs 2.11, if you're ready, I'm ready. <clears throat> you see this scripture and you say, what does this have to do with forgiveness? Well, you'll, you'll see it in just a minute. But notice what it says. It says discretion with what? Who doesn't want protection? Just think about that for a minute. Who doesn't want protection? Yet here in Proverbs, the book of wisdom, <clears throat> it's telling me discretion will protect me. And then it says, and understanding will what? Who doesn't want to guard? I mean, just think about it. Pastor, what is this talking about? What are we, what are we trying to say here? Here's the thing about discretion, church, is that we can be discreet at work because we have certain rules and laws and HIPAA laws and privacy laws and you know, all these different types of laws that you protect the patient or protect the client or protect the customer. We understand that discretion. But this is not what it's talking about here. You know, sometimes I believe that we are so professional at work, but terrible at home. Can I preach already? And so I believe there's things, church, that we need to be very discreet about at home, and we're not. We're not. And so uh, uh, it, it, certain things happen at home between our children, between our loved ones, between our, our spouse, whatever the case. And I, I'll say this, you need to ask the Lord for wisdom. You need to ask the Lord for wisdom. I tell you the three things I tell you to pray for every day, wisdom, revelation, and discernment. Those are the three things my father taught me. Is to this day, I still pray about them. I don't pray for items. I don't pray for material things. I don't. I pray for these three things, and the Lord gives me the other stuff. And so Ask the Lord for wisdom on a daily basis. Lord, show me, teach me to be discreet. Why? What it does, it protects me. And understanding, Lord, give me understanding because it guards me. And like I said, wisdom is the key here. It protects those that we love. Now here, let me, having said that, let me clarify something real quick because, because although there is some things that you should stay quiet about, there are some things that you should speak up about. Having said that, abuse. There's abuse in the house. That's not discretion. Open your mouth. Speak up. Talk to somebody. Get help. Suicide thoughts. Death. Death threats. Danger. Stuff like that. Open your mouth. Again, wisdom. Sometimes people say, oh, I don't know if I should say it. It's none of my business. No, if someone's life's in danger, open your mouth. And so I'm just laying that as a foundation so you can understand the difference and when to have wisdom and when to, when to speak and when to stay quiet. There's this story in Genesis, and I'm going to start right off the bat in chapter 9, verse 1. There's a lot of chapters, but I'm skipping throughout. In your Bible app and in the Lifeline app, you'll see all the chapter, all the verse there. I'm not going to go through it all, so just stay with me. Watch what it says in verse 1. This is the story of Noah. I know you know this story, but I'm going to say it again. Watch what it says. Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be what? Fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish of the sea. It says there, they are given into your hands. Verse 3, everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you what? Everything. That's the God that I serve. Now, you read that first part and it talks about it talks about the, the Lord blessing Noah and saying, you're going to be fruitful and I want you to do this. And he's giving them instruction over the world and over the land and so on and so forth. What is happening here? You have to have read chapter 8 and know what is happening to understand chapter 9. You have the whole story of Genesis where the Lord tells Noah, Noah, I need you to build an ark. Remember, it had never rained before. It had never rained before. In fact, the only time that, that the, the plants and everything would get watered. It was never from above. It was always from below. Don't ask me why. I don't ask questions. I just read the scripture and I believe it. All right? It never rained before, yet everything was green. Well, the Lord was fed up with certain things in, in, in the land that he said, it's wicked. He says, I'm going to destroy it all. I'm going to do a flood. And you know the story. What does he do? He says, no, I need you to build me an ark. He is obedient day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. While no one had ever seen rain or flood, God asked Noah to do something that was just crazy. I mean, really, it wasn't anything that you would say, oh, it's understandable. No, it's crazy. 
It's crazy. It's almost like if I told you to prepare for something that you've never seen, you'd be like, no, that's a waste of time. Well, that's what Noah did. He was obedient, and he did that. He got the animals aboard the ark. You know the story. The flood came. It destroyed all the land. It destroyed all the land. It did. It killed everything that was living, uh, animals, human beings that were left. It was, it was done. So what happens? The flood is now over. And finally, after 40 days and 40 nights, the ark is where it's at. Noah comes out of the boat or the ship or ark, whatever you want to call it. And God says that. Be fruitful. Why are you saying be fruitful? There's nobody in the earth. Everything is gone. So they're having to start again. He'd done, it with, he'd done it with Adam. It had grown and he had to start it all over again. And so here you, you have Noah being blessed by God. And why is he blessing him? Why is he pleased with Noah? For one simple reason, what we talked about last week, obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And while Noah did both, the Lord was very pleased with him. And I want to I just stress that to you one more time. If you want the Lord to bless you, Don't ask him to bless you. Just be obedient and it comes with the territory. It's that simple, church, really. Really, when we're obedient, boom, it comes. So then watch what he says in verse 8. I'm going to jump to verse 8. He says, then God, then God said to Noah and to his sons with him. Verse 9, I now establish my what? With who? And your descendants after you. And with every, verse 10, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the dark with you, uh, of the ark, excuse me, of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. And then finally he says in verse 11, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. People say the scriptures uh, contradicting because they say, well, what about all those floods that are going on in here and there and, and people that are dying? You've got to read the scripture carefully. He says, never will I destroy all of life. God keeps his word, church. God keeps his word. And so he is establishing a covenant with Noah. Now, before I have to get the, into the rest of the, the, the story, I have taught you before uh, the difference between contracts and covenants, but I'm going to give you a little bit more insight on that. Why? Because you serve a covenant God. You don't serve a contract God. Are you hear what I'm saying? You sound like you're asleep today. You're with me. You serve a God of covenant. You serve a God of, 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 of covenant, not contract. You say, what is the difference? Well, they're both the same in the fact that it's an agreement with, between two people, but the nature of the agreement are different. Let me explain. A contract, watch this, is for personal interest. What am I getting out of this? contract. A covenant is actually the complete opposite. What is the benefit for the other person? I'm making a covenant with God. Why? Because it's going to benefit, uh, that person is going to benefit me. So when I make a contract, what do I want? When I make a covenant, what would you like? That's why marriage is not a contract. That's why marriages today fail because we treat it like a contract. I got real quiet in here. Let me keep going. Contracts, watch this, have conditions. The moment you break that condition, the contract is broken. I don't care how cute you are. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care if you have whatever the case. You break a part of the contract, the contract is over. Done. And you signed it, so you can't do anything about it. You can't sue them. You can't touch them. You can't do anything. You signed it. A covenant is different. A covenant is based on unconditional promises. Unconditional promises. Contracts, conditions, covenants, unconditional. That is why when we go under marriage, we say till death do us part. We don't say until the next honey comes around. Can I, can I just be really real with you today? You'll find this is the only pastor probably that discourages marriage. got real quiet up in here and some of you some of you are saying see that's why I don't want to get married (laughs) no it's because we jump into something without not understanding what a covenant is if you're not gonna make a covenant with your spouse that means through thick and thin for better or for worse in sickness and in health till death do us part don't get married having said that you're saying you see well that's what I'm gonna say well I'm just saying you that if you stay on the outside you're still not gonna get blessed completely because you're not under the hand of God 
There is promises and there is blessing that comes with covenant. I'll leave it at that. Watch this. Contracts are based on if and then. If you do this, then you get that. If you do this, you can drive the car. If you do that, you can have the house. If and then. While covenants are based on love, trust, love, and respect. A covenant. Trust, love, and respect. I'm not talking about the love that you're saying about, oh, he bought me a diamond ring. No, 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 no. I'm talking about that kind of love. I'm not talking about the, uh, flowers and candy. That, that's the, 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 the cherry on the top. That's the extra stuff you want to do. Tonight. That's extra. I'm talking about the commitment. What 2 Corinthians teaches me what love is. It is patient. It is not proud. It is not envied. It is not boastful. It always trusts, always protects, and always perseveres. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. Contracts are temporary. You sign a two-year contract. You sign a one-year contract. They're there for a period of time. Covenants, watch out with it. They are not. They are permanent. They are permanent. And here, I just wanted you to make have that clarity because here, God is not signing a contract with, 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 with Noah. He's, he's, he's filling and sealing the deal and establishing a covenant. Watch. Verse 16. I'm going to jump to verse 16. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all the living creatures of every kind on the earth. Verse 17. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant. And I have established between me and all of life in the earth. Isn't it amazing to think that thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, this was written in a book. It's in the Bible here today. But today a storm can come and when the rainbow comes, we just think it's pretty colors. No, it's God talking to us, telling us that my covenant still is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You think somebody just created colors? You think he just wanted to put a little... No, God says, I'm, I want you to see it with your own eyes. I'm going to make that. I mean, have you ever stopped to look at it and just wonder? Who can make some, so, so, such a perfect ark? Notice, ark, the ark. And yet the Lord divides the colors so that we can see the rainbow. And I just say, oh, this is pretty. No, it's not about pretty. It's about that God is alive and he's making covenant and he promised it a long time ago and he still fulfilled it today. God is faithful, church. God is faithful. But something happened. This is where the story comes in. Verse 18. Watch what it says. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I didn't name them. I'm just telling you their names. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Now, I've read this story so many times, and I never really caught it. And I love, like I said, how God gives revelation every new time. But for whatever reason... It's clear, and it, and it doesn't say anything about Shem, and it doesn't say anything about Japheth, but it does say that Ham was the father of Canaan. Stay with me. These, in verse 19, these were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who scattered over the whole earth. Twenty, Noah, man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. Verse 21, when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and laid uncovered inside his tent. And now the story begins. I did some research, and I prayed, and I asked the Lord, and I couldn't come up with the answer other than I can give you options. So I'm going to give you those options. Because the Bible doesn't tell me why he got drunk. It just tells me that he got drunk. It also tells me that he was the first to plant a vineyard in a land that was dead. Stay with me. So these are what some people say. Jokingly, some people say that after being in the ark for so long, he could use a drink. I've been on a cruise ship for seven days, and I know my wife's getting ready to get out. This was 40 days with animals, and I'm not talking about luxury accommodations. I probably would have used a drink myself. Maybe that's the case. Another or other group of people say that because he planted the first vineyard, he really didn't realize how, how strong it would be, how fermented those grapes would have come out and... He thought, well, I'll, I'll be all right. And, well, he wasn't. He got drunk. Another uh, option or another, uh, you know, probably maybe situation was that 
he was an older man. I understand Moses was of age, 500 plus years at this time. Yeah, I know what you're saying, right? that's crazy. Get drunk with NyQuil. His body was not able to tolerate maybe the alcohol that he could when he was younger. I'm just giving you reason. I'm not telling you what it was. I'm just telling you that the Bible does not tell me, but it does tell me that he drank and he got drunk. And then it goes on to say in verse 22, Ham, again, the father of Canaan. It has to tell me that again. And I never realized it until you realize it later. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Now watch this. Just so you know, you say, what's the big deal? He went into the tent and he saw his father naked. Church, the sin, first sin was that he got drunk. But the sin from his son Ham wasn't that he saw his father naked. The sin was that he told his brothers about it. P -p Please stay with me because you're saying, I I'm, I'm, I'm losing you here, Pastor. I'm, I'm, I'm lost here. Church, back in those days, Israel, Jew Jew uh, Jewish custom, that you couldn't do that. It was, it was uh, uh, disrespectful, dishonorable to see someone naked, especially being your own father, and then going out and telling everybody, oh man, I just saw dad naked. You laugh, but when you study the scripture in the true meaning, that's exactly what Ham did. He ridiculed his father by, 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 by not only seeing him naked, but by sharing with his brothers. Oh man, you're not going to believe the way dad looks in there. You're not going to believe it. This is why I say discretion protects us. Stay with me, church, because this is going to bless you. Stay with me, church, it's going to bless you. And he was being dishonorable. The commandment states, the commandment states, honor your mother and your, you know the commandment, church. It's the first commandment with the promise. It's the first commandment in scripture. It's not a, 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 an option. It's not what you think. It's command. It means it's an order from God. What did I just say about obedience? If God's telling you to do it, do it. Honor your mother and your father. What's the promise? So that you may live a long, good life. Now, I know some of you are having a hard time clapping your hands because that's the problem that we're in today. We don't know how to honor our parents because our parents have failed us. Our parents have failed us. They have left us. They have rejected me. They left me. They, they you know, they, they did this. They did that. You know, what? My father was a drunk pastor. You want me to honor that? You want me to honor a father that was drunk? You want me to honor a father that, that, that did this to my mother? You want me to honor a father that I don't even know? <laughs> I'll give you an illustration before I get into the real story, and then I'll take it from there. There were twin boys. You probably read this on Facebook. Twin boys raised by an alcoholic father. They were raised by an alcoholic, alcoholic father. And the, and, and the story goes on to say that one person as they grew up says, why don't you drink? He says, the twin, one of the twins says, because I saw my father. The other boy, twin boy, drank and was a drunk. And they asked him, why do you drink? Because I watched my father. Did you catch the analogy? What am I trying to say? Pastor, what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say this morning to you is that there are two boys with the same dad but with two different perspectives. How you see your life and your condition determines your destination. You have a choice of to say, I will not be like this, or use it as a crutch and say, oh, well, he did it, so I'll do it too. And that's the generation that we're living today. But when you can change your perspective and line yourself against God's will, you don't see that as a problem. You don't see that as a pothole. You see that as a circumstance to wake you up and say, I will not be like that. I will not be like my father. I will not be like my mother. And you can change that. And so while your perspective may change your destination, it is forgiveness that will give you the freedom to enjoy the destination. Wow. Watch. Don't confuse. Now, I know what you're saying because you, I'm going to get here and, it, and it's going to rattle some of you and you're going to be like, okay, now you lost me. Stay with me. Don't get on your phone. Just watch. Don't confuse 
the one that planted the seed with the one that raised you. Can I preach or not? I'm going to say it again. Don't confuse with the one that planted the seed with the one that raised you. Watch. When the scripture tells me, I'm going to get some, I'm going to get some like, "Uh uh-uh, pastor, you're, you're, you're crossing the line. When the scripture says, honor your father and your mother, it's not talking about the one that gave birth to you. You say, you're going to have the pretty with scripture. Oh, I am. I'm talking about the one that raised you. Oh, see, I, see, see, I got mixed reactions. Some want to clap, some want to don't. Stay with me. Pastor, but, 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 but you got you to give me some more because that's not really biblical. Really? Oh, really? Joseph was not Jesus' biological father. Do I have to remind you that, oh, man, if, wait till you get to part four of this series. It's the final cherry on the top unplanned part four embarrassment you don't want to miss our Christmas Eve service Joseph did not have to take Jesus in he didn't have to take Jesus in church I'm trying to tell you that those that raise you it may be an aunt it may be a brother it may be an uncle it may be a grandma honor my mother and my father church anybody can have kids that's not the blessing the blessing is the raising the oh you're not hearing what i'm saying church you're not hearing what i'm saying you're trying to be too cute and some of us jesus could have had an attitude he could have he's jesus he could have had an attitude and done exactly what this generation is doing today and said joseph you ain't my father i don't have to listen to you you want me to come? I don't have to listen to you. He could have had that attitude. But watch, my God is so wise. And he says, I know that 2,000 years later, there will be children without fathers. So I need to teach them today how to live for tomorrow. Watch. So the word that we use is step. We use the word step and we dilute it by insinuating that the step means the other guy. But I've got news for you, church, today, that when that father stepped out of your life and he stepped out of your way and he stepped in, out of your way and, and, and abandoned you and he stepped out to reject you and he, stepped, he got you by the hand of real Jesus and said, come with me, because the stepfather Stepped in, stepped up, stepped out so that you can have a real life. Oh, y'all not hearing what I'm saying. Thank you. Somebody give them praise today, church. I'm trying to honor somebody today that's a step parent. Somebody that said, I'll clean up the mess. I'll do what he didn't. Oh, y'all not hearing me. I dare you to touch three people and say, it's right. That's right. Oh, God. Can I preach or no? (laughs) Watch. Pastor, how then did Jesus honor him? He honored Joseph by respecting him. Watch. And following in his footsteps. Why do you think Jesus was a carpenter? You think God from heaven said, I want to make you a carpenter. He says, this is the man that raised me, even though he's not my biological father. I will let him teach me what he knows. Joseph was a carpenter, and he taught Jesus the same thing. Honor your father and your mother. Pastor, what about those that left me? What about the one that really gave birth to me? What about my real biological father? Those you leave in God's hands. Those you leave in God's hands. But watch, we, verse 23, it's awesome because look, Ham dishonored his father by seeing him naked. Not by seeing him naked, I'm sorry, but by speaking of it. But look what Shem and Japheth did. They took a garment and laid it across their shoulders and they walked in, they walked in what? and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father naked. 
Let me show you what this looks like. Here we have Noah. He's drunk. He's had too much to drink. He's had too much to drink. Go ahead, gentlemen. And he is plastered in his tent. Ham comes in and says, oh my God, this is my father. This is ridiculous. But Japheth and Shem came and without seeing him, looking away, covered his nakedness. Oh, y'all not hearing me, church. Y'all not hearing me, church. They didn't want to see their father naked. They didn't want to dishonor their father. They could have. He wouldn't have known. But there's value in honor. Watch. When they're covering him, they're basically saying, we forgive you. We're protecting you so nobody else ridicules you. Discretion is protection. And so much of it, thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to leave you. You stay right there. You stay right there, but you guys are good. They covered him, and you can stay like that. They covered him to protect him. Now watch this. It's interesting because this is a man who was godly but made a mistake. God has just barely, just, just, just a few verses established his covenant. And Noah put his guard down, and he fell to drunkenness. This represents our generation today. But watch. We're not doing this. You know what we do? Yeah, that's my father. And instead of being discreet, church, we blow up social media to make our own vulnerable and ridicule them because look, this is a joke. Just with the little simple towel, whatever, clean yourself. You make me sick. I hope I never grow up to be like that. Church, but Jesus came. And he said, I will not only cover you. Nobody has to know what you've done because nobody else can save you. He not only covers you, he helps you up. Come on. Because what we see is not what has happened, but what is going to be. That is faith. I don't see a drunk father. I see a godly man that saved the judge. Oh, y'all not hearing what I'm saying, church. The Bible lights, please. The Bible tells me how many times should I forgive? It says, 70 times 7. That means when they fail you, you forgive them. And they fail you, you forgive them. And they fail you, you forgive them. You got to be like Peter, church. Peter said, love deeply, for love covers a multitude of sin. Somebody give them praise, church. Woo! Stay standing. We're all to blame for that. Pastor, he made a mistake. So do you. So do you. So do I. Church, I pray that if this man up here ever makes a mistake, you share some grace. Because you don't know the pressures that pastors are under of temptation. You want to know why pastors are killing themselves left and right and why they're dropping their churches? Because they're elevated to some pedestal like they have to be perfect. I am not perfect. Trust me. Hopefully you can extend some grace. Watch what it says. I got to finish, but stay standing. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, watch what he says in verse 25. Curse be to 
Oh, y'all better catch it. Y'all better catch it. Curse be to who? It wasn't Canaan that found him drunk. It was Ham. I can get into curses all over again. Noah doesn't curse the son. He curses his grandson. Just digest that for a little bit. And he goes on to say in verse 26, he also said, but praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan, again, be the slave of Shem. Watch. Verse 27, may God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tent of Shem. And may Canaan, repeat it again for the third time. Watch. Be a slave to Japheth. Watch. He curses Canaan, not Ham. When we don't cover to protect, we are uncovering to ridicule and make vulnerable. The fact that Ham was not willing to protect caused a curse not to him, but to his children. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Be careful what you're saying, church. Be careful whose kids you're talking about. Be careful what man or man or woman you're talking about. It's going to fall on the ones you love dearly. I'm telling you. But watch. But when we cover to protect, look at what Psalms teaches me. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. The promise of protection when we learn to be honorable, discreet, and learn to forgive. You know why the holidays are so stressful for some of us? Because we've uncovered the situation for so long. And when people come in and start talking, oh, you're the one that your dad, you go along with it instead of saying, you don't talk to my father like that. Pastor, but it's true. Oh, I know it's true. They knew their father was drunk. They knew their father was naked. But when you shut their mouth, you are honoring them. You're saying, but they don't deserve honor, but you do. And what you do today, you'll reap tomorrow, church. Can I go deeper? Watch. This is Genesis. Fast forward to Joshua. Fast forward to Joshua. God pulls him aside and says, now my servant Moses is dead. Rise up, be courageous, and do not fear, for I am with you. I am about to give you the land of Canaan. That land should have never been taken away from Canaan. When we talk about the, 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 the Israelites going in and sending spies and taking the land that didn't belong to them from the Jebusites and all the ones that didn't with sites, when we're talking about that, that was Canaan, the son. It got stripped from him hundred years later because what we speak will always come to fruition the Israelites were afraid they didn't know what had happened but they were obedient and they took a land that was theirs and it wasn't supposed to be but because of the mistake of Ham those people lost their lives you fast forward to first King King Solomon made them slaves what did the scripture say you will be slaves under my people. You don't think we're living in this time of different generation today? Church, if we could write a book about our lives, you could go back 50 years and see what your parents and your grandparents said, and that's why you're probably in the mess you're in today. So what do I do? We come to the altar. Because he's the only one that can break any chain, any curse. 
anything that has been proclaimed back then, the Lord says, I can break it in Jesus' name. And although the curses last for the third and fourth generation, when you are honest and when you are obedient in my word, it lasts as a thousand generations of blessing. That's biblical. I'm not making it up, church. I'm not making this stuff up. First things first. You don't have Jesus in your heart. Maybe you backslid from Jesus. Maybe you've been hurt. This is your time to come up to the altar. We have some altar guards here that want to pray with you. You say, I just need Jesus in my life. I want to accept him in my heart. I want that Jesus that you're talking about. I can only give you about a minute because I got to go to the next altar call. Anybody else? I got some people walking up. Just give me some time. Amen. Come on up, come on up, come on up. Awesome. We have one over here. Miss Diana's over here. Okay, she got it. She got it. Okay, very good. Anybody else? We've got 30 seconds left before I go into my next altar call. How many times should I forgive? 70 times 7. Don't do the math. It's one of those that's just saying, just keep forgiving because I keep forgiving you. The altar's open for anybody else. That maybe you've been dealing with something. Your plans didn't work out. These plans weren't supposed to work out this way. Noah was uh, supposed to be blessed and it was supposed to be great, but he failed. And sometimes when we open those plans, they don't work out. Last week they opened bitterness. Sometimes they open unforgiveness. Some of you need to forgive today. And you're having a hard time swallowing this sermon and you're having a hard time even wanting to pass up. Well, I'm going to give you 45 more seconds. If you're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of dealing with this. I'm doing it for me and I'm doing it for my children. I don't want my children to live under what I lived. I don't, I don't want them to go through what I did. Come on up. Amen. Amen. Come on up. Come on up. Anybody else? I know you're fighting. I know you're fighting. It's all good. It's all good. We've all failed. We've all made mistakes. It's all good, church. Come on in. Squeeze in there if you can. Just squeeze on in. Squeeze on in. Squeeze on in. Squeeze on in. The Lord is here today and He wants to cover you. He wants to protect you. He wants to bless you. Amen. We still got some more coming. There's still time if you're up in the bath and if you want to come, it's open. And as we sing this song, listen clearly to the lyrics. Jesus isn't dead. He's alive. And he still heals today and he still restores today. If you're not coming up, would you do me a favor and just worship him for a minute? Don't leave just yet. Let's be reverent to the Lord. As the Holy Spirit is moving throughout the song to touch these people here today. Just open your mouth, church, and just say, I want it out. I want it out. I want it out. Would you worship Him?
covers us and protects us. So we must do the same. Think before you speak. Think before you post. Think before you share. Think before you tweet. Think. Ask yourself, is this edifying? Because if it isn't, nobody needs to hear it. At the end of the day, it all falls back on us, church. And I want your children to be blessed in Jesus' name. People say, people say all, all the time I hear people say, oh my God, I feel so sorry for this generation that they're, they're being brought up in this type and, uh, of world that we're living in. And I don't feel sorry for this generation. I believe that God is awakening this generation. And they had to see all that ugly stuff so that we can build some hard Christians with a backbone. Christians that are not afraid to stand for what they believe in. They've seen the worst, they've seen the bad, but they stand on God's grace and God's mercy. I believe it, church. <clears throat> Take this message and apply it in your life. For if you don't apply it, it's just another message. But remember, ask the Lord for wisdom, and He will give it to you. He will give it to you. Next week, we continue with part three, and then we're going to finish with part four. We're going to finish with the band. You don't want to miss the series. But I want you to do me a favor. I want you to invite somebody. Bring somebody. Just say, hey, man, you, you got to come and hear this. This is, this is the word of God. It will bless them. It will change them. Even if they don't want to stay at Lifeline, it's okay. As long as they get that seed in their life. So how many of you here for the very, very first time? Would you raise your hand quickly? Anybody here? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. So there's a VIP table out there. Make sure you stop at the VIP table. We want to we wanna bless you with a little gift. And... Uh, Again, we have nothing this week. Uh, all our Wednesdays are off until we come back from the New Year. Having said that, G12 continues on Fridays. G12 continues on Friday. What is G12? You're suffering from an addiction, bondage. You're maybe stuck with OCD or any kind of just something weighing you down. G12 is the group for you. And remember, in the next two weeks, not, not, not right now, but Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, where both our services are on Saturday at 6 p.m. here. They're going to be at 6 p.m. We want to make sure you, you join us. And remember, if you're going to want to get baptized, you've got to sign up. If you want to get baptized, there's an info table on the back right, my right, your left. You want to sign up and get baptized. I love you. God bless you. God is faithful. Amen. Let's do our part, church. God bless you. We will see you next week for part three of Unplanned. We'll see you then. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the message. For more information, check out lifelinehow.com.